Paul Rouse is here. Paul, let's start with the executive pay because we just played that clip and people will be interested in it. Um, they didn't have to do it, but they did have to do it in a way because that's where we are as a society at the moment, particularly given everything that's done. But fair play to them for coming out. This feels like um, this feels like there's baby steps in the right direction here and, and towards a more transparent organisation. Um, this is, I would say it as a landmark report in, in the manner in which the GAA conducts its affairs. It's it, the tone of the report, the content, the manner in which it's organised, the absence of hubris, the acknowledgement of difficulties, and remarkably, a clearly set out vision for what the association should be, succinctly put in half a page, rather than the product of a commission str strategic report with external consultants that costs a bomb and nobody reads. Um, I think it's, I think it, I think the whole thing is, is it's a credit to Tom Ryan and it's a credit to the association. It's not to say that there aren't a couple of problems within the report, but I, I think it's what you would, if you were a GEA member, it strikes exactly the right tone and has exactly the right content for what you might wish to see. That's the most positive thing I've ever heard anybody say about a, an annual report from the GEA. And, and you know, it's great to be actually to be able to say something positive yeah. about the manner in which in the manner in which the GEA is run uh, at central level now. Th there, it's not. It's not that there aren't things that need to be done. It's not that there aren't gaps in it, and it's not that there isn't. It's not that there's a clear and absolute definitive plan. The devil will be in the detail in the workings out, but as a document which sets out how the organisation is conducting itself, what it, what it needs to do to fix problems and where it needs to go, I think it's what you look for. You can't solve a problem if you can't diagnose it. And yeah. clear. So in a way, like Tom Ryan obviously inherited this gig and there were a number of squalls that kind of blew through the association over the last period of time. This is him now getting to grips with it. This is his organisation. That's his senior management team. This is him properly feet under the table as the person who has the main gig as opposed to just the person who was the finance guy. Yes. So this is his first, like obviously, this isn't his first annual report, but it's certainly his first time where he's been able to go, okay, I've, my, my committees have been in place. I've worked with a, a president for a couple of years now. I've, I've had this role to the point where I can begin to expand what my vision is. So let, let's start with that, because that's very interesting to hear you say that. Finding There's a confidence about it as well. I mean, he's... he's and I, I want to say this clearly, I don't know Tom Ryan. I met him very briefly once at a committee. I didn't ever have a conversation with him. And so I don't have a dog in the fight here, um, in the sense that I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not given to him or in, any, in any shape or form. But you have to judge it by, by, by what you see and by the words that are written and by he lays out. And if you want to start with, he has a page which is 66 pages into the report, which is a logical follow-on of everything that he said before, and he maps it out clearly, what his vision of the of what the GEA should be, um, and I can point out a couple of yeah. Things. Let's talk about this. So this uh, the the page is a uh, sustainable GEA. It's, it's called the, the sustainable heading. GEA, and he sets out eight points of of how he sees the future. Number one, the year is demarcated more clearly with defined rest, rest periods. Number two. The burden on county players' time is lessened with a lower proportion of training um, to games. Number three, county players play much more regularly for, for their clubs. Number four, clubs are self-sustaining in that team, uh, team managers and coaches will, um, will, come, will come from within, within a club. Um, number five, that lessens the financial burden on clubs, which anyone who's involved in a club or in, in a county understands all of that lessens the club and the county financial burden. It is hell to be involved as an officer in a club or in a county board at the moment to try and generate finances for the day-to-day -day operation of that organisation, let alone for capital investment for the future. Number six, the central pressure to drive money is lessened because all of that happens. So therefore, we don't have to squeeze everybody for every penny when it comes to everything else. Number seven, we have better organisational structures. So we have a supported officer base. That means it doesn't take over your life if you organise this. And number eight, the burden on volunteers who run clubs and run counties is lessened. And therefore, you can actually enjoy it a little bit more. So I think there's one gap in that list of eight. 
and he alluded it to he alluded to it in its in his comments there, where he talked about fixtures making progress, mm. and that from that I read a pro- the production of a proper calendar of play for adult club players. I feel like the defined rest periods is kind of a that's it's a code. A, it is for fixtures. Yes. Yeah. But it must include a coherent fixture, a club fixtures for things. And in fairness, the new plan for a unit in Croke Park which will assist with this is something that we've been looking for for years. So and he's moving towards it after this Congress. Is the new unit, sorry, I don't, I'm unfamiliar with that concept. So the new unit would be a, a, a body, like a full-time professional person who counties can ring up and say, help. And, and, uh, and the devil again will be in the detail in this, but it's also a way of auditing that counties are actually providing a proper fixture calendar for their club players. Yeah. Um, because the headline stuff is executive pay, the debt on Porky Cueve, um, the rampant expense that's out of control for running these county teams, they're all symptoms, right? Yeah. They're symptoms and of, these are the answers. A, of an organisation that hasn't, up to this point, had a, well, at our core, if we do these things, and we ask the question, does this help with our core business, or are we doing this according to our, our beliefs? And if the answer is no, then we don't do it. Like, do we have enough support for this infrastructural project in Porky Cueve? If the answer is no, well then we're not doing it until we actually put in place the right committees and structures and professional body. And this is why I think the report is great, because it is undemonstrative in, and somewhat boring in the sense of those list of things that are fundamental, eight pillars, fundamental pillars, and they're written in very simple English, very clearly put, and he then comes out with a line which says, to me, that's not revolutionary. Now, if he does those eight things, it will revolutionise the operation and the experience of GA members around the country. If he does those eight things, if he leads, he can't do them himself. Sure. Like, if he leads the doing of those eight themes through a proper management structure in Crow Park, which isn't just uh, a director general, general with a whole flat line of, of people under him who report directly to him. He needs a coherent management structure over it. He needs a sensible president with him who, who, who will assist in driving volunteers around the country in support of him. And if he does those things, this is revolutionary. He says it's not revolutionary. But it is in terms of how it would transform the association. How achievable is it? That is, again, this is, this is the, the... It's not going to be a revolution in the sense that we're going into the GPO and everything's going to be fine after April. That's, that's, not, what, that's not what this is. Like the, we might have 100 years of difficulty in the aftermath. We might, we <laughs> might, there might be partition in the middle of this. But, <laughs> but, but it's rev, it, it's, it, will, it will be done in stages if it's to be done. And you can see with Congress, with the, with the new fixtures plans, you will see it in the proposals for, 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 for new championships. But again, it's one thing to set this out. It's another, another thing to do it slowly. And you can see he's, he's a way of doing things. Um, for example, with rule changes in football in Hurland. He talks about nudging the game, and he's really talking about football, nudging the game in a more expansive direction. And I think he, what he's looking at here is nudging things in a very particular direction. So, Paul, why do we then have a situation where, and I think fixtures are one of the most important things to be looked at at the moment, especially when it comes to these eight facets of Tom Ryan's uh, philosophy, why do we still have a situation where the CPA are looking at the fixtures being brought by Central Council and walking away, while people who are inside uh, the tent, even temporarily, are saying, no, we're not having this, we actually don't believe in the direction the organisation is going fixtures-wise. Like, I, I, I don't understand how that can tally, because like, on the outside looking in, some of the, the new fixture proposals looked really good to me. They looked like they might fix calendar issues, whereas we'd, like, we've spoken to the CPA on the show and they've said that actually perhaps these sort of great fixture proposals may not actually meet their end point, they may not actually come to fruition because they might be out there for optics. Um. Yeah, that's a really good that's a really good question, and I think this CPA's position, which I have huge sympathy for, uh, and in fact I agree with the CPA mm. in in their diagnosis of of what's wrong. Um, I I it's the product of decades, and in particular the last decade, but decades mm. of neglect of club players, and it has created an anger, which is entirely justifiable and legitimate about the way in which they've been treated. But, and, and, and again, I agree with that. But it is that thing about um, it, it being the art of, of the possible here. 
uh, and you have to think about how change comes. If, the, if you come in with a vastly radical um, solution and insist on it being introduced now, I just don't see that happening. Mm. I, think you're, I, think, I think incremental movement is, is, is the only option here. And I don't see... Uh, it, look, this is fairly clear. You give this another 12 months. You give this, you see, like it's lined out in his report, what he said, what he believes. You give it another 12 months to see demonstrable progress in a particular direction. The proposals from the fixtures committee are not an end in themselves. They can't be an end in themselves, sure. they're not enough. But as a staging post, if, they're, if they indicate a direction of travel, then I, I, will, I, I, will, I will take the best of those, right? Once they've been worked out. But it, it's not an end point. It has course. to be a direction of travel. And, and I guess that has to take into account then the Tier 2 Championship as well, which obviously has been brought in under Tom Ryan's stewardship. Yeah. Like, obviously you can't attribute everything to the Director General when there are other people working in this, but it has happened under his watch. Like, if the Tier 2 situation is a Tommy Murphy situation again, like, does that not kind of make a, a huge problem of a few of these yeah. eight points that he's made? So I have a fundamental, I have two fundamental problems with the, with, with the report and I have a fundamental problem with the Tier 2 Championship which I think is not a good proposal. I don't think it's well worked out. I don't think it's been properly thought through and I don't think it fixes anything. So I fundamentally disagree with Tom Ryan on that. What I'm talking about here in this is the broad thrust of where he's going with the association. Isn't the whole issue of Tier 2 the problem with the structures that we have in the GA and that that was the President's idea and Tom Ryan can't say we're not doing it because actually the President brought it in and he was elected and yeah. the Politburo can't say no, this is going to be a failure. They have to do their best to try and make a success of it. And, and as we know in any organisation which relies so heavily on volunteers where, vo where there's a volunteer section meets a kind of a permanent civil service section, there is always tension and yeah. working out the structure in that nobody has cracked it, cracked it on this one. It's a really difficult thing. It's a really difficult thing to work out. And again, I, I have yet to meet anybody, I, I, and I, I mean this, I've yet to meet anybody who thinks the tier two proposal as set out is, is an end game in itself. Yeah. I, or we, or we'll fix anything. Yeah, I, so I agree with you, but what if in five years time we're looking back at what, uh, or 10 years time we look back and go what John Horne did was introduce the concept of tier 2 to counties who up to that point have been and players who were staunchly resistant of it they fixed those structures when they flipped the seasons and we now have a league in summer and the championship is actually the provincial championships are essentially the first competition of the year and they're run off in a month and then we've got two months of, of time for clubs to take over and then there's this short league season which is 12 weeks and everybody goes, wow, that's amazing and there's three divisions. Then the whole tier two and tier three thing was just a, it was a backdoor introduction to that. Everybody would be happy with some kind of solution around that, I think. I, I'm, I, I, I've heard that argument and I see, I can see the logic of it. Personally, I don't think that people within the GEA are incapable of grasping the idea of a tier two situation and they don't need to see it made real in front of their eyes to understand Fair enough. that it can be We introduced. didn't need this. We didn't need it. We could we, have gone straight. We, needed, we came at this the wrong angle. Yeah. The stuff that needs to be done around calendar is much more important. The stuff that needs to be done around fixtures is much more important. The stuff that needs to be done around finance and organisation, they will allow the construction of, of, of other things, not the other way around. You would say, in fairness to Tom Ryan, the whole point about the fixtures committee, which had the CPA in the tent, which had the GPA in the tent, was that they were getting there in the meantime, the elected representatives were like, I need a tier two championship, lads, let's go. And so that came in. It was almost like, really, we've got this little thing going on over here which might solve all our problems. Can we just wait and see how this goes? And it was like, no, we're getting tier two now. So, so I have a boring answer to that. And the, and the boring answer is that I actually don't know what happens inside in Krug Park. I don't know if that's what the dynamic was. Um, it, you, you, you may very well be right, but it, to me, to me, it was the wrong way of doing it. Yeah, OK. Uh, Tom Ryan made a very valid point yesterday that these out-of-control inter-county costs are hampering other areas of expenditure within counties yeah. in terms of coaching, in terms of grassroots. Let me play the video of that, because actually that's interesting. He's, he's here talking with um, John Duggan. Here is um, Tom Ryan talking about the level of spending by inter-county sides, saying it's unsustainable. We, we, we haven't really, we haven't cracked that. There was a period um, three or four years ago when that cost appeared to be 
if not coming down, at, le- at least appear to be capped, it's, it's increasing again. Um, and it's not really sustainable. I mean, the, the, the sheer amount of pressure that it puts on counties financially is, is unsustainable, and the pressure it puts on county officers individually um, as, as volunteers to both bring in that funding, to make sure that that funding is deployed to the best effect within counties. The sheer amount of stress, hassle, pressure that it puts on all of us is, is not sustainable. We, we, need, we need to address that. Yeah, so like the, the point on the back of that being that like I, I always thought that say intercounty costs they can run away as far as they want and they, they are siphoned off and it's actually a ridiculous notion of course it's coming from other areas within county boards and like the, the question is how do you actually stop this and Tom Ryan is the first person there to say that I don't know like how do you stop this situation of what is it 32 million quid being spent in intercounty teams uh, alone last year now if anybody believes there was only 32 million euro spent <laughs> on intercounty teams last year uh, they they have a relationship with finance <laughs> which <laughs> i would love to see their personal bank accounts as a spectacular work of fiction they must be um there was way more than 32 million spent on intercounty teams and that's just in the current expenditure look at the uh, capital expenditure for the infrastructure to allow the inf- intercounty game generate the money, which is never included in this spend. So, for example, we have the headline figure of almost 100 million euros on Parky Cueve, with an outstanding debt of more than 20 million, which is never factored into the costs of the running of the inter-county game and everything around it. But what we're looking at here, of course, is opportunity costs as well, the fact that if you spend money on one thing, you can't spend it on, on other things. Or if you invest time generating the money for this, you can't spend the time um, generating... The, you can't spend the time generating the ideas which will actually do the things that are needed to be done in in each county and again boring point but it comes down to calendar look at the amount of counties that were back training in october for pre-season competitions that began at the end of november Mm. for a season that will end at the end of august for certain counties like how, how in what rational universe does that make sense i mean it makes sense if you are if you are a person who is given to that and who has a job out of it and all of that but that's a whole load of expense and time within an association which is devoted to something that is particular to the needs of a very small few mm. and that's not sustainable every training session ends up costing a fortune because you've got to pay the nutritionist and you've got to pay all those professional staff who aren't the volunteers um, I, for, for me i tell you something on that i want to tell you something i was out in the national aquatic center um, running magnificently around the pitches out there. I, got, I, just, I, I had an hour and I went out to the National Aquatic Centre to the sports grounds around it. Um, in either, I think it was February of last year, uh, the annual run, and I go out and, and I was running around and I saw these, I think so, there was Lee Keegan. It was a Wednesday night. It was a Wednesday night between, before Dublin played Mayo in the league in Croke Park. And Mayo had come up and trained, because there are so many players based in Dublin, they come up and they trained in the National Aquatic Centre. There were more than 30 players out on the field playing a full match, length and breadth. It was a great game, great game of football. Right. Um, there were maybe four players on the sideline. Internal training session. Internal oh, training right, okay. session. And it was being videoed. There were at least 10 support staff around everything. And there was another bunch of players the Killian O'Connors and that who were coming back from injury in the gym so that's a pound of more than 40 yeah all in Dublin for an evening with, tra- with all of that involved and um, all had to be fed presumably and I know that there are volunteers in that thing who don't get paid for anything yeah but that is an expensive operation and that's before that's a Wednesday night before a league game in February so what is the story all across the place? Well, famously, Tipperary needed another bus for their support staff for the All-Ireland Final. It was like one for the staff and one for the team. Um, or at least that's what they said. It was, it was a, it their footballers. Mark. their footballers for a long time. That's the way it was. Yeah. And it didn't actually end up benefiting them in the long run. Like, they've, I, I don't know what the Kildare footballing identity is. I, it, it seems to be to pay an outside manager to come and, you know, whatever... Um, over the three decades, I'm not singling, singling, singling out the uh, current one, but like, what is our identity as a football county? Like, who are we? What what do we stand for? We stand for a falling down St. Conlet's Park and great underage footballers who then disappear because there's no strategy behind it. There's no, I don't know. That that's that that would be my. It's one of the, it is one of the great enigmas for anyone who ever sees Kildare club football or goes and plays against 
Kildare teams and who sees Kildare under 18 and under 20 teams. And the power and pace with which they play, how many skillful quality footballers they produce, the number of club players and, and the number of schools teams. Yeah. Right? And then something happens. Yeah. And I, I think that this all comes down to that. And it's like, uh, it's, it's sustainability is actually... Yeah, the, the, it's the key word in this. Yeah. And it, it is a buzzword for the moment, right? But there's nothing sustainable about getting an outsider to come in for a year and a half, flake everybody and then go away again. Like, Not if you don't have the structures behind it. There is nothing wrong with somebody coming in into a structure that's properly organised, but the idea that this, this you put in, you do the top layer of the cake first. And that's it, yeah. That's just not going to happen. Yeah, and, and so Kildare is just a microcosm of, of what is happening in loads of other um, counties around the place. Like, So you, your takeaways are that you're positive about the, the person who's at the helm and having a vision. What are the other quick challenges that... Before okay, so I want, to, I, want to, I want to line out, line out two things. There's a brilliant sentence in this where Tom Ryan takes on the idea of the role of the club. Right? And he's a great line on it. He said that he himself believes that the, this pri idea of the primacy of the club is more of an aspiration or a statement of intent than an inalienable fact. Inalienable, I can't say that fact. Now, did you ever think you would see a leading member of the GA acknowledge the fact that this is an aspiration of a state or a statement of intent rather than an illegal fact about the centrality of the club because, of course, it's a statement of reality that the thing has become skewed. Mm. And it's great to see that set out clearly. Where I absolutely did, um, kind of diff uh, move away, diverge from Tom Ryan on it is when he talks about the ticket price increases, which were fundamental, by the way, to the rise in, in revenue. In, in revenue. Yeah. I know there were more play people went to the games and I suppose he uses that more, 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 the fact that more people went to the games to talk about the well-received ticket price increases last year. Now, I've never seen ticket prices for anything well-received, no. but these ticket prices last year were outrageous, the increases on them. They, they, and I'll give you an idea of how outrageous they are. Okay, there was 10 euros on an All-Ireland final ticket, 5 euros on a semi-final ticket, 5 euros on an All-Ireland qualifier, which nobody is going to, 5 euros on Division 1 and Division 2 football matches. Now, we can say that they're okay in themselves, they're not massive. But if you're going with, uh, say there, there's a couple of you going to a game, that's where you very quickly rack up costs. And the basic fact of it is, the All-Ireland final is now 30% more expensive than it was during the, the Celtic Tiger. And Division 1 league matches are now twice the price that they were. I mean, we, we fundamentally accept that the country lost a run of itself during the Celtic Tiger. And we're way ahead of them prices-wise. Yeah. And there is a myth about the GEA, and the myth of the GEA is sport for all. And the, the, the truth of it is, and anybody who's involved in a club in Dublin understands this. It may be slightly different in, in, in country areas, but if you're involved in a club in Dublin, you are paying enormous registration fees for that club, for, to be a member of a club. And in certain areas, you can be looking at, you register in a kid and it's 200 euros plus. That is not sport for all. For, like, for once they get it out of minis, is it? Yes. No, no, it, 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 yeah, once you get them into under eights or, right. or under, under tens, it, it begins to go. Right. And it really goes. And the idea, those ticket prices, it is very, very expensive to go to, 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 to matches now. If you have to travel and do all of that. And to regard, I just, it was just a misstep in the middle of to talk about the well-received ticket price increases. Okay. There was a couple of other things, like the women's organisation, that's, yeah. uh, you, yeah, and, and their view to whether or not they come inside the organisation or not. Yeah, and the one club mod model, 40% of clubs have signed up to the one club model, which basically gives parity of steam within the, the uh, within the club to Ladies Gaelic Football, to Camogie and to... Um, um, to 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 the to to get it, to, to the GEA, forty percent have signed up. Another forty are on the way to signing up. There is no word of the other twenty percent. I would love to know what the story is. That twenty percent of twenty percent of no, other not clubs. doing it, lads. Not doing it. And it is that thing. I come back to that point of sport for all. If it's sport for all, it wasn't sport for all for the GEA for many 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 years because it was sport for the male all. Yeah. But not for for, for women. For the lads. Left right. Sport for lads. Women left absolutely um, on the margins. And GEA clubs are being dramatically improved by the ongoing revolution in which sees women take a more central role 
within within um, within the association. Yeah, and we had the Camogie Association in talking about their Manal program, which is trying to get more female mentors, which is the next wave that's going to actually completely transform how this looks. Yes, but Com the Camogie and the, so the association. I'll take the example of Dublin here. The Camogie and the association and the Ladies Gaelic Football Association will also want to get their own house in order and get in house in order very swiftly because the manner in which they treat girls in Dublin, for example, is outrageous. And I'll give you an example. In in the under 13, under 14, under 15, and so on championships, they 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 set out a calendar of play which means that girls can play football on a Saturday and the following day go out and play a, a camogie match on a Sunday. And they're set fixtures, league fixtures which matter, and, and championship fixtures which matter week after week. Now there is no, there's absolutely no code of best practice which will tell you that that's fine. Playing a game two days in a row? Yeah. Right. How do you fix it though? I don't I, Is it week on, week off? Is that the answer? Yes, yeah, it's really simple. Right. Set a calendar of play, sit down, agree it. Um, getting is, is, that, is that revolutionary? It is, yeah, it is. That's the thing. It's like getting everybody around the table. But uh, but the other aspect of this, which we haven't talked about, is the the lands in Clonliffe. So oh, yeah. Apparently, they're going to put the um, LGFA and the Camogie Association in the same building in uh, Clonliffe beside a couple of pitches. So that in itself might be revolutionary. Everybody's going to be able to walk across the corridor and go, what's your fixtures? Now, that's at central level, so obviously the local level has to filter down. But These guys know each other already, Ger. This is not... This is... This is... Uh, this is not... This should not be... This should not be difficult to do. This, re this requires... And it comes down to one basic thing. Looking after... Your, your, looking after kids. Yeah. It's as simple as that. That's Look after the kids properly. Um, we've obviously had a very interesting election over the last while, an elect interesting election campaign. I know you've had a look at all of the manifestos of the various parties. I'd say some of that was hard work and some of it was like, oh look, I, I blinked there and I missed that uh, reference to sport in your manifestos. What did you find and what would actually be an ideal scenario at the end of this for where sport sits within the hierarchy of Irish government? If you look at the, I read all the manifestos for, 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 for the, all the parties before the election and it's completely understandable that sport plays a minor part in the manifesto. So we have to be realistic here. We may, while well, sport is central to our world uh, in very many respects, we also have to say that in the, in, the, in the hierarchy of things that need to be done in the country, sport fits into housing in, this, in the sense of the provision of, of um, sports fields, of playgrounds, of basketball courts and as and skating parks and everything yeah you know, or both urban and rural it fits in to what we need to do with housing it, it's dependent on transport to get to to very many places it requires a proper education system which is properly funded and isn't given to granting enormous sums of money to elite fee paying schools and privileging their their needs above everything else it it is it is also Depend, it is also has a part to play in health. So f sport fits kind of everywhere. But in an, an, in an entity of itself, it is given relatively little, um, relati relatively little space. But out of these manifestos, there is the makings of, of a reasonable policy and a reasonable um, idea. And you can see the ideologies of the various parties and their differences being coming out into things. Like the Greens, for example, um, want to promote youth and child-friendly water sport to encourage uh, awareness of our maritime heritage. That's one of the things that, that the Greens want to do, as you would expect. And they want to, they have four basic principles for their sport policy, improving health, developing communities, enhancing social inclusion and participating um, in nature. And it couldn't be a Green Manifesto without saying this. And I have to admit, I agree this, and it's going to drive sports people nuts, but they're talking about the importance for kids of, of low stakes participation. And that is that they will encourage Limit and to the limitation of, of score keeping and record and record uh, taking and all that. No, that's fine to a point. Yeah, it's fine to a point. There needs to be a mixture of both that and seriously competitive sport because kids love competition too. You can't just give everybody a medal. Like it just doesn't. No, it, but the kids know. Like they end up competing they within know, the games, exactly. even when there's no score kept. They keep score themselves. So like. But the, the the point of it is to create a sporting or recreational culture. Yeah. Where if you want to play. You there's competition play. over there. There's no exactly. competition here. Everybody does this, and you can all go over there if you want to. And you're yes, and exactly, and you're not just sit standing in a tracksuit running on with the water for for somebody else. That's so that principle, that principle. Um, I agree, but the, the greens is, the greens don't really have any policies beyond a broad statement of desire. 
this is we'll fill this bit in later. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's not it's not central to 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 what they wish to do. Um, solidarity, people before profit, uh, want more physical activity in schools. They want better fruit and veg in schools. Um, they want to create, and this is where we get the ideological part. They want to create more publicly owned gyms and pools, and I fundamentally agree with that. Um, um, but the reality of it is. Um, if councils aren't able to build houses at the moment, they're not building gyms and pools. What I would argue is that when in the new in the new building, which is now inevitably going to happen in local areas, that publicly owned gyms and pools and recreational part of, spaces are part, part of complexes. Of like they talk about the importance of tracks around the place and of and of skate parks and of of playgrounds and mm. having funds for that. And that's exactly right. It's exactly right. The best part of Fianna Fáil's manifesto, um, I would say, I would argue. The best part of their entire manifesto, in terms of how it's set out and what it's done, is their amply anti-gambling, uh, or their 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 um, proposals for taking on gambling. And every single party would do well to take on what they wish to do. They wish for the establishment of a um, a commission, a gambling regulating commission, exactly, and just sort out this issue of uh, when you can gamble, how you can gamble, how you can look at how companies deal with with problem gamblers and everything to do with that world, which is entirely regulated, unregulated. Yeah. In, not entirely unregulated, but it's largely unreg unregulated. Yeah. Um, some of their proposals suggested, it seemed to me, was going to be driving you to use accounts from... See, it, it seemed that there was a way to circumnavigate some of the issues that they were coming up with. So the, the gambling regulator, if there is going to be one, needs to have proper teeth. Yes. So you can't just say, look, you can't sign up to accounts that are based on servers in Ireland. You can do the same thing on a, a server in Malta or Gibraltar. And so yes. It just needed to be thought through there, to that there, next level, I thought. Yes, absolutely agree, but it, is the, it was the best it was the best of anything that anybody came out with. It was the largest step forward of anything, and, and, and I agree. And people will always find ways around this. Yeah. But it was a starting point. Um, they did talk about a cap sports capital program and a playground fund and twenty five million extra spending in 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 schools, which it's very hard to disagree with. But you have to pay for it. Yeah. Um, Labour Party, Labour Party, talked about using the betting le a new betting levy to fund. Um, to, to fund in, investment in sport. The Labour Party did what uh, was obviously um, the thing that nobody wanted anyone to do, in that they actually offered, costed, six serious proposals and thoughtful proposals on what you could do. And it went, they just, like everything they did, they should have just clearly picked a number out of the sky and run with it, uh, because that seems to be the way things work. But they actually pl worked on how, how they should do it. They had coherent proposals for uh, for, for women participation in the governing bodies of, of sporting organisations. And most importantly, they talked about the reorganisation of government departments and the creation of, of a better structure where sport would sit. Mm. Why does sport sit with transport and tourism mm. beyond the fact that it's an afterthought? And in the last government, it was so clearly an afterthought when you had a government minister who was not in any way no, it's not clear that he knew anything about transport or tourism either, but he certainly knew nothing about sport and how it would operate, and he had no interest in it really when it comes down to it. Yeah. And he's left, you're left with a junior minister, and a junior min to be a junior minister in a senior department is just... Pointless. Well, where are you going? Yeah. So, so the Labour Party proposed the introduction of communities, art and tourism, arts, heritage, community development, all of that within one department, and that just seems to me to make sense. It's a new government department which, which goes across all of these... Um, all of these various strands. It seems to me to make more sense, and I think that's one thing you could take from the Labour Party manifesto, is that broader structure. Now, the Sinn Féin manifesto um, talked about increasing spending on sports and recreation, increasing the sports capital programme, um, and then talked about sport, the importance of sport in a post-conflict revolution society, um, which was kind of interesting. Um, and it made nice noises around class and gender and geography. And it probably focused more of all on what, on, on what it called working with all sports bodies to support the creation of all Ireland teams and leagues wherever possible. Um, and it also wants to support elite athletes. Now, in none of this, it had, there, so there's aspirations set out and no plan. Just, just, and that's fine, it's a manifesto, it's fine to a point, but this idea of supporting all Ireland teams. So what are the non-all Ireland teams? Football. So how do you do that? 
Seize the six counties for all your tanks on, on the lawn in Windsor Park. <laughs> Is that it? Well, I, uh, I actually... I, I actually, I'm asking this as a serious question. Right. I, 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 I am asking this as a serious question. And my serious question is this. If you want a United Irish soccer team, or you want a United Ireland in general, what does that look like? And how do you get there? We've got like 30 seconds left here, and you just asked the biggest, most fundamental question that we have been unable to answer as a country for 100 years. What does it look like? It looks like building some shared understanding. It, it means um, building a trust with people who fundamentally don't trust us and not being triumphal and triumphalist when you get that moment of power. It means not shouting up the rat the first opportunity that a camera is put in front of you. It means not lying about that afterwards, like, oh, I didn't realise we were being... Like, it's, it's that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's explaining the fundamentals of what it means to be Irish without defining us as not British. It means like these are the shared heritage that we that we we have almost exactly the same DNA with a tiny little kink that's different, and yet that's the bit that separates us. It means not concerning ourselves with the difference between transubstantiation and whatever the other thing is. Like none of that stuff actually matters. It means being friends with your neighbours. That's that for me, and building an, an Ireland off that off the back of that, and then saying let's play football together. That took you a little bit more than thirty seconds, which is a bit disappointed with you, but <laughs> but but it it is it is it is it is exactly right. And how does singing come out ye black and tans help create an all Ireland soccer team? How does it help create a United Ireland? If there is a United if there is a United Irish soccer team, what is the emblem on the jersey? What is the anthem that is played beforehand? What is the flag that is flown before matches? What what does any of this look like? And how do you intend to get there? Or is it simply a numbers game? It's, it's very interesting. We had Cormac Moore in a couple of months ago talking about his new book uh, about partition. And he said that actually what it came, what it came down to in the, the, the splitting of the two football organisations was actually internal politics rather than the politics of the country, which is kind of very fitting with the last year we've had with the FAI and all the internal politics there, that perhaps the most complicated issue is once you take Jur's uh, ideal on a United Ireland is actually getting through and wading through the mud of uh, the internal politics that exist and the, the clinging of the power in the IFA and the FAI that I'd imagine would exist. Well, I agree with that to a point, but it was all, the, the context is the wider political context. So it's not just that the people don't get on. Like, why did, we, by the way, the GEA, like, for rugby, rugby is an All-Ireland organisation, but for huge swathes of the country, for a long time, until professionalism, rugby had no relevance because it was associated with a very particular class, class. Or, or professional yeah. things. Yeah. The GEA is an All-Ireland organisation, once you're of a very, prof but not if you're loyalist. Yeah. So the GA has a lot of work to do itself. And it is doing work, in fairness, but there's a lot of work to go. Yeah. All right. Look, we are out of time. Is there one last point you want to make on the manifestos? Um, I would say that even if you do all of this, the relationship with Sports Ar Sport Ireland has to be clear what you are trying to do here. And who's in charge. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Paul, that's great. We'll definitely come back to that. Um, what will a United Ireland football team look like and how we might get there uh, in the future. Right, Irish rugby captain Kira Griffin joined Joe last night and spoke about the enjoyment she gets from working on her parents' farm. Have a look.